Okay. Okay, let's get started. Uh, so welcome again to the meeting. Uh, I don't know if Stefan's going to show up. Uh, he might. Otherwise, uh, Z's out for this week because he had a he went somewhere for the Saturday. The Saturday, so he won't be joining us. That's okay. Uh, so how's everyone doing? Good. <laughs> Jesse, how are you doing? You text or you uh, sent me a Slack message. Yeah. You sent me a Slack message uh, earlier, so um, yeah. So uh, Ankit, so Ankit was telling me before the meeting a little bit about his week's activities. So mm -hmm. do you want to go through that? Yeah, exactly. I will, I'll share my screen and I'll okay. show you something. So entire screen. So you can see that? Yeah, it's coming up here. Nice. All right. There we go. Good. Yeah. So I just started uh, writing the code so uh, and the documentation things. So uh, here I have uploaded the things which uh, like I have like made separate folders, which is the prototype, the thing that I made earlier. Uh, before, so I made a separate folder for that, and the new, the new thing that is being done, I have, I have set inside this. So we have execute.py, which basically takes care of uh, executing the things, and stimulus.py, which is which takes care of stimulus, and vehicle.py, it takes care of vehicles and vehicle tools. Uh, these four are the major codes. Vehicle tools takes care of acquiring in instantaneous coordinates and. Uh, several other other functions that vehicle has so uh, just try to, to try to make it in a in a structured way so uh, uh, I'll, sh I'll show you the readme that I that I'm preparing I'm not yet done but I just uh, doing that so uh, this this I'll read about what is this about what is to be done and these things okay so yeah and I'm also simultaneously making this uh, presentation. So uh, again, the same things, but more interesting thing is is the the this thing uh, the recording that I was talking about. I've added oh, yeah. recording. Yes. Yeah, so if you see see this, uh, is it not coming up? Uh, Okay. Uh, oh no, why is it, why it is not open? Yeah, it's open. So this is for two EV. Yeah, this is. Oh, wow. So yeah, so you see the vehicles are actually making a path. They they are uh, they are approaching and they after since this is a co coordinates behavior, so they are just getting away from it, there's another stimulus here, so they are actually getting away from it, there's another stimulus here, so basically they are making a path, so the base uh, escape route, uh, in, in case, this is in case of 2A, so if you, if you wait and see, it will be like a very nice simulation, it turns out to be, so. Yeah, so you have multiple yeah. images in there now. Yeah, yeah. Th these are, these images are like uh, the representation of stimulus, Different stimulus types. So, uh, uh, still, still, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in the process of uh, keeping it to a single vehicle type. Not like every vehicle is here behaving like cowardly, which is true because I have, I have assumed uh, till now that these these stimulus are actually cowardness provoking things. So, actually, if we see these kind of things or patterns, we see in even uh, insects also, so maybe something like that is going on inside the veins or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're kind uh, of coordinating around. So they're just kind of avoiding all the images. Yeah, space. exactly. Okay. So, and coordinates as as a behavior represents that like 
these vehicles are actually approaching the thing but once they they find that this thing is is something of uh, fear they just stay away so that that's that's a like a good representation of the behavior as coordinates so yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah, and I'll show you the things that uh, I just have. Uh, uh, like I, I, I made some some customization to take input on terminal about what kind of vehicle you want to run or something like that. So, okay. uh, this this says that uh, like uh, it's about personalizing the environment. So, press one for single fixed. Single fixed stimuli and uh, two for multiple moving stimuli. So I'll press two. So uh, a maximum number of stimulus al allowed. I press just one for the time being. And uh, if I put the vehicle as three A, then we would see vehicle three A, which is this. So uh, every this three A is the kind of loving behavior. These vehicles are following the thing. So. Uh, so actually, uh, from from uh, one structure code, I can I can actually run multiple type of vehicles based on my input. So, and later on, uh, once we have different type of stimuluses, so we can uh, like customize things as we wish. So, for the time being, I would write I would complete the documentation and uh, we'll move on with that. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. So this. Is, so, do the, I have a question. Yeah. Do the vehicles communicate with each other in any way, or are they just like no, no. Okay. Actually, uh, I think I should add something like because in practical life, the, the these can't like uh, get into one particular space. So I have to like uh, uh, add some algorithm to handle proximity issues. So these these are the things that I would do later. Okay. So what will happen in that case is. The one vehicle tries to uh, take a space and uh, uh, avoids other. So these things will be like some herd of things following this, like uh, the way you want. So in this case, what's happening is is the every, every vehicle is trying to get as close as to this thing. So these are like getting compressed as the, as the time passes. So yeah. yeah. And I have just added a. I think this is an older feature that when the vehicle, when the stimulus is passes by, so they are they are basically trying to follow the. So the antenna of the vehicle uh, also reverses, as you can see here. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I asked, oh, yeah. You know, I asked about the communication. Mm -hmm. So that's because uh, they, you know, so if you've seen like uh, swarms of insects, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, usually that like when they do like, uh, you know, some sort of emergent phenomena or swarm programming when they simulate it, there's usually communication between the agents. And mm -hmm. like people think that you need communication to get the pattern of swarming or collective behavior. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it almost suggests you don't absolutely need it to get that kind of behavior. I mean, you know, it might change the, it might modify the behavior maybe more in terms of what you want to see. But I mean, it's just yeah. interesting that there's no communication here and they're still doing that same sort of thing. Yeah, but so. actually in, in practical or physical, if, if we try to make a physical robot, so they will try to bump into each other. So just to... Uh, Avoid that thing. Uh, so yeah. uh, we need to do some proximity uh, deal with some proximity issues. All right. Yeah. So I uh, was just uh, about like writing down things about these things. So uh, still, still about to do. So uh, I'll uh, maybe complete that in one or two days and then send to send you the, the presentation and this. And we'd up update it on orthogonal research uh, GitHub page, in my page. Yeah. Yeah, it looks and pretty good. Uh, this thing. Oh, yeah, you got it open. Good. Yeah, yeah so, uh, yeah, I've been, yes, the behavior is more emergent. It's very cool to see. Thank you, Jesse. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
So uh, I was uh, going through the um, paper as we were talking about. Are, are you? Do you have anything else to show, in Kit? Uh, I don't think so. So I'll stop. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. Um, so let's. Why don't we just go to the paper then? And exactly. See. Let me present. Okay. All right, so here's the paper. Mm -hmm. And we worked on it a little bit this week. So we still got the introduction, the motivation, uh, neurodevelopment, uh, some of these other topics, uh, neurodevelopment of brain networks. Mm -hmm. We, oh, here's where we have some notes. Uh, this is again for, uh, I had, Ankit might have some stuff on emergence in his uh, outline. I mean, just yeah, just do the, the, yeah, just fill out your outline. That'll be good. And then we can move things around in the document. That's what I did with these contributions. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then Jesse can add in some contributions under models of regulation. Um, mm -hmm. we'll continue to talk about that. So I added a new section called methods. So this is mm -hmm. like again where, you know, some of the more uh, detail, spe you know, specific stuff to the model is going to go for each person's implementation. So uh, in Z's case, you know, he presents some information on a heavy algorithm and some information about code. So I'll just mm -hmm. get, move that stuff to here. And then the results, of course, we have this computational model of developmental neuroscience. Uh, you know, Jesse, you know, can add to that. And I have some things I might add in. I'll actually present on some of the stuff that I've been doing this week or in the last couple weeks uh, next in the meeting. So, but anyways, we can add to this. And then the software instantiation section. Uh, so this is Z's contribution I put it in uh, mm -hmm. again it's this is the basic uh, basic information about the uh, approach so this is an introduction it talks about the olfactory system the associative memory and everything like that and we'll just put that in there mm -hmm. and then this would be the place for uh, Ankit's stuff here, which is uh, his deep learning swarm model. I don't know if you want to give it a, a better title than that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would actually think about that. So I was actually thinking of this thing, that what exactly, like the second section that I wrote, uh, that what is to be done uh, from this project of my simulation, what is the ultimate goal. So actually, uh, the way things are turning out, it seems like it will actually uh, become become a good uh, autonomous system which which is capable of decision making of itself so uh, and, and in turn it, it uh, expresses or some certain imagined behaviors are coming out of that as a result of uh, wiring that we want to uh, do so uh, i think that's what i, I would do, right so first first once my presentation and uh, this GitHub uh, documentation is over. I'll, I'll try to uh, write down that in, into the doc that we have written. Okay. And I'll, I'll get in touch with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I like the way that Z did it better. Just like you know, put it in like a, a GitHub, like a Markdown document, and then I can bring it into the. I can cut and paste into the document. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'll probably move it around because I want to keep the references. Um, I don't know if you want to number the references, but that would be a good way to do it. Have you ever seen the IEEE style where you bracket the references and put a number and then just put like numbers down below? And then yeah. I, when I incorporate it, I can track the numbers so I can keep the references with the citations. And then, you know, I, they, so if something gets moved around, I can track it um, where it's supposed to go. Yeah. So that's I that's so that's that part and uh, then the discussion and future plans. So again, this is from Z's write up. This is going to be like 
just some basic, you know, future plans, and we can talk about, you know, what if we need to think more about what those are going to be, we can talk about it. And then finally, a use cases section, which is again, like, you know, how you, what kinds of experiments you might run. Now, in your case, you wouldn't necessarily have a use case, but, you know, you could have a use case if, um, yeah. 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 And so, again, that's uh, a use case is where you take, like, the, the platform and you might do some experiment uh, or some, alternately, some uh, use. Like, is it particularly good at, like, analyzing certain types of data? Mm -hmm. um, that might be the case. And in, in which uh, case you would, you know, come up with something like that. We actually, in our ML group, we were talking about pre-trained models. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the ones that they use in uh, deep learning, uh, they use it in uh, NLP, which is linguistics uh, analysis. And, you know, they have a number of pre-trained models. I don't know if this, you know, it, where this fits in the deep learning area, if it's just kind of like, uh, you know, uses deep learning or what. But we can we can talk about, you know, that sort of thing as well in the use cases. Yeah. So what I was thinking is, given the thing that I showed you, that uh, just considering one type of behavior as coordinates, it it may be like uh, can be used to trace, uh, like optimize paths uh, to escape the some kind of stimulus which the vehicle wants to avoid. So if you if you saw the if you saw the simulations, it was actually uh, showing very good uh, path actually that which way to escape. So that can be used as one of the application I just felt. Uh, in, in some field, we may, we may use that. So, and we have different type of behaviors, so uh, we can have different optimized paths. So I think you, you talked to me about some optimization things of some times ago, some, some day ago. In our yeah. Talks. So, yeah, it can be used as to optimize path. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, 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 you know, it's probably something that isn't uh, like something that a lot of other packages have. So that's a good selling point. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, keep thinking about like how you might, how you know, so how does this platform differentiate itself from other types of platforms where you're trying to do, you know, image recognition or, um, and then if, you know, if there are other things that it can do that you might think are interesting, you know, both mm -hmm. for simulation or for like a, um, you know, a, a machine learning tool, then, you know, write them down and propose them and we'll talk about them. Exactly. Because, so, it, uh, yeah. So for the time being, we have only one type of stimulus. So uh, as my original plan was to introduce different type of stimulus as an image, then some kind of sound, then text. So we can do, uh, we can do processing of those. So that that would be the uh, second part, which is deep learning part. So before I get to that, uh, I would just try to complete the documentation and just make sure that everyone understands what I'm going to do and what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's really very important. That's a critical part of it. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, we have like so we have like uh, again, you know, we have like a methods section. Uh, where we have, uh, let's see, let me share my screen again, or I'm actually presenting, so. Uh, we have, you know, so we lay it out like very simply, you know, give a description and then we can insert equations as well. So, you know, if there are equations you think that are useful, you know, you can put them in um, and then, you know, we kind of relate it to the software, so. Uh, and then we'll separate that out from this sort of descriptive uh, section where you're kind of laying out what the model is, but it's a little bit more general. And yeah. then, um, yeah, and then this part here at the end where we have these cases, which we just talked about. Yeah. Um, so then the references, too. So we have the references. I've added some references in here. Um, and then this might be of interest to Jesse. Um, you might want to go through some of these references if you uh, want to, you know, see where, like, I guess in this part here, you know, get a gist of what we're doing in the paper. 
Um, or, you know, we can come up with references for your section, but we're going to put them, you know, we're going to insert them sort of later on in the in the bibliography. So we already have like 21 references. Yeah. I, didn't, I don't so have I have a reference. In, in my case, the references would be uh, mainly the library that I'm using and certain other things. In my case, actually, I have, I have assumed my own activation function, which is like in, 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 in inhibitory uh, sensory activation, the, the activation is function, activation function is like k into k1 plus k2 into r square. So that kind of things, they are, uh, I don't think so. I, I, I actually shared a paper in which they proposed a model for, for vehicle 2 and 3, but I felt that was too complicated because they they uh, they introduced something, uh, some rotational mechanics thing. So, I'm, I'm only uh, I'm only concerned about the kinematics of the vehicle. So uh, I, I would write that up. So that would make uh, that would make more sense later on. Okay. It is. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be good. So, mm -hmm. so uh, let let me share my screen and show you the things that I would write, and then we can present. You can like uh, uh, see if, if I can some do something more. Or something. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You can see. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the contents are like I've, I've write, written on something. So, so basically, what the what this repo is about. So the second point is important is what is to be done. What is the ultimate goal of the the, the simulations that we are making, and then a little information about uh, Burton Bird vehicle. What is it? What it is, and what basically it is. So uh, and so, and later on the environment that I have built up. So. Uh, show you the picture. I've, I've inserted the picture of the environment uh, here, and uh, I, I don't know if we can. Uh, I was actually searching for the thing if we can uh, add videos to this uh, this README file. I was struggling to uh, find any anything relevant. So, do you know anything? Uh, any any way in which we can embed the video here? Oh, I don't know in a markdown file if you can do that. I know you can. Put a link in, or you can link an image. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. You might just, yeah, you might just, yeah, maybe link to YouTube. Yeah, there might be a way to do it. Um, exactly. So that would be a better representation because in the in the presentation I can see the video, but here in the markdown thing I can't see it. So that's uh, uh, that's the thing. I think I, I was actually reading something. Uh, on Stack Overflow, they said that you can put on a YouTube link, so that will appear something like it is. It is shown here. Yeah. So, yeah. So I can work on that. So, um, in the code, actually, I have used these stimulus, uh, these uh, coordinates of these vehicles. So I will try to write down what exactly, uh, which point represents the point in the code. So oh, these yeah, things have to be done. Good. Yeah. That would uh, actually trying to relate whatever I'm doing in the code to uh, to the uh, documentation. So the wiring rule and activation function in the code, if you see in vehicle tools, there is uh, there is activation function. Activation function is different for different type of vehicles. So in this case, these are like uh, one B, three A, and three B. The the vehicle is the activation function is actually inhibited, so this is this type of activation function, and uh, in the other case, it's it's the other way around. So, and in vehicle four A and five B, there are different type of activation function which are like something like bell curve. So that that would again add up here. So this was the plan to like organize the thing in a simple way, so that I can type of vehicle or multiple type of vehicles at a time in, in a single run. So these things I will write, write down and the wiring rules are like the weights which are uh, yeah this W1, W2, W3, W4 these actually represents uh, the weight in like if uh, it is parallelly wired then the weights are 0, 0, 1 something like that yeah so decide the wiring weights of the vehicle type so if the weights are, I've, I've uh, deduced these things in such a way that it comes up something like that. So
so if the weights are like this so this will actually act like parallel wiring so uh, need to write that down write these things and actually make some schematic diagram to make everyone understand so um, the second thing is and thereafter we have vehicle kinematics so actually why these vehicles are moving is because there is a, a change in rotation speed of these two wheels so uh, if the rotation speed of this wheel is actually more so the wheel the vehicle will turn like this will go like this because it, and it will follow a circular path because this wheel is actually rotating fast so it has to cover more uh, more uh, distance so these are the things that are actually underlying underlying uh, logic that are happening in the vehicle yeah so i try to write that down and finally the what what are the things that are currently done and uh, setting up processing dot py on uh, on terminal and on uh, writing that down in some uh, text editor so i add, add, add some information here and future development inference and these things are generated i would add later on so good yeah so the, for the activation functions you know you can just put mm -hmm. I, I guess we could do them as equations but you can just write mm -hmm. out like a quick uh, you know the way you have it in the code just put it in the document and then i can turn it into an equation yeah or, so uh, yeah. yeah yeah i would certainly write those things uh, once once on, like once the documentation is finished here on github and uh, i'm doing uh, these things simultaneously so hopefully these things will be done soon yeah yeah good mm -hmm. well yeah uh send it to me when you're ready for me to look at it uh looks like you're doing yeah, pretty good yeah, yeah thanks yeah mm -hmm. okay so mm, that's all for me yeah oh jesse said another way to do like an animation in markdown is to make a gif an animated gif oh GIF or, files. yeah or yeah. You associate a jupyter notebook so you mm -hmm. can, yeah, do those things. Um, yeah, so... Okay, nice. So basically, I just need to convert these video files into GIF and then upload it there. Yeah. I it works. Yeah, I think you can actually convert, like, a, a movie doc to an animated GIF. Like, they have converters online where you can, like, yeah, upload exactly. a video, yeah. So... Nice. Uh, Jesse also, all right... Oh, about the new part that I added to the document. Jesse asked about that a while back. So, uh, the new parts I added, uh, yeah, I added the use cases, which are just, right now, it's just what Z had in his uh, document. But I'll work on, the, you know, developing that more as we go along. And Jesse, if you want to help me with that, you can. Um, and then their references yeah if you add your own make sure that you either you know make them sort of separate in a separate document or just make a notation that's like added references basically we want to make sure that the references are always linked to something in the text because mm -hmm. you know if you just put the references down and note and put the text separate and then say i'm going to get back to this and add in my uh, references, then it's sometimes it, it, you don't know where it goes <laughs> at when it comes time to put them in. So, yeah. Um, and then I also add, I also made the methods section, which is, uh, again, it's just kind of the more sort of uh, detailed parts of the write up. And don't, mm -hmm. you know, when, when, NCAT, when you're writing up this stuff, don't worry so much about how that's going to work. I'll just look at it and We'll, we'll separate them out and then we'll go over it after and make sure that we have the right mm -hmm. things in the right place. And it'll be things like equations and, and things like that. But mm -hmm. and then, So those are the only references I added, Jesse. Okay. I do see the changes. Yeah, okay. That's good. I mean, you can just, you, you know, uh, like create a markdown file and, and write, you know, do some writing and and then we can, you know, it's easy to copy and paste into the document uh, in, in wherever we want to put it. So that's good. All right. Well, thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Ankit, for showing your.
demo there. It was very good. Yeah. So uh, do you think uh, uh, like the thing that I showed, I can I can add some more section or make the doc look more uh, representative of, of what I'm doing? Um, like in what way? I think these things are more than enough to uh, show that what exactly I'm doing. Yeah. yeah, I think that that should be it. I mean, if you fill, flush out those sections, um, mm. you know, we might we might add more later as it get. Well, we'll look at it. You know, as you go along. Uh, you mm. know, once you're finished, we might look it over in the meeting and and you know say where you might need more detail or when we get it into the paper, because you know once you have everything together, it's easier to see where we need detail and where we don't. Mm -hmm. Because uh, yes. you know other people are writing things and we might you know i mean there you always want to put in more detail about it like you want to the goal is to make it reproducible but i don't know if that's how you know how to communicate that <laughs> that's the key like yeah. if people can understand what you're doing and maybe you know use the software um mm -hmm. that's that's what you want yeah exactly so uh yeah, and um, I have some certain issues that I had. Okay. Like I have, I still have certain issues which are not resolved. Like the the vehicles are like turning like anything, or or I was thinking if uh, I'll show you this thing. I was thinking if I could uh, like the way these these vehicles are like either are they like horizontal either this uh, either uh, uh, this way or this way. I was, I was thinking of like the way its its uh, velocity is if, if it could uh, orient if if it could orient itself into this in this form like it is going into this direction so it could go in like this so for that i i need to multiply with some kind of rotational matrix so these things uh, i would like to work upon so okay. yeah 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 okay, okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah. And so we'll revisit this, uh, you know, when we're ready to, you know, uh, when everything's when the write-ups finished. And I like the yeah, I like the way it's coming along the demo and that. So, mm -hmm. and we can actually maybe you know, well, like I told you about the video and GIF. Uh, mm -hmm. We might actually use the video just you know as a supplemental material too so uh, oh. we might yeah we might have a gift for the the mark for the markdown um, document but then also have the video that you know we can link to yeah, exactly. the video so you this, know, sometimes yeah mm -hmm. yeah so actually uh, if if that is the case uh, we have like many type of vehicles about six type of vehicles and we have different versions of the environment in which we have single vehicle fixed, single vehicle moving, and multiple vehicle fixed and multiple vehicle moving. So we'll have a lot of recordings, so that will be a lot of work to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fine. This is the local PC, local things that I have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah it sounds good. So why don't I, uh, I'm going to present something now. I know I haven't presented anything the entire time we've been meeting, so... <laughs> Uh, so this is something I've been working on. Uh, I've been actually working with a couple people, like in talks, you know, talking online and just kind of informal. And then I decided to mock some of the stuff up. This is also stuff I've been thinking about for a while, but I haven't really known how to implement it. So let me present my screen here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a little abstract too. So if you know, it's the first time I ever presented it. So. Let me uh, just go through it, and, and maybe you can give me some feedback. So can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so this is, the title is Euler Paths for Life. And it's like, so this thing here is an Euler path, or sometimes they call it the Seven Bridges of Canningsburg problem. And the idea is that you want to be able to cr uh, find a way to cross these bridges only once but cross every bridge. And so, like, it's a, it basically gives you a circuit. So this is a problem from, it's a 
Canningsburg was a village in, in Europe in the 17th, I think it's still there, in the 17th or 18th century. And Euler used it as a shorthand for this mathematical problem where people wanted to figure out a way to cross every bridge only once. And mm -hmm. since there's seven bridges configured in this way, there's really no solution, easy solution to this problem. And so this it seems like kind of a trivial problem, but actually it's a very important problem in computer science. Uh, and we'll see why in a little bit. Uh, and then these are pictures of different forms of life that have sort of a geometric uh, property to them. So seashells and diatoms. And so uh, diatoms are the ones on the right. These are actually a form of algae that uh, grow cal calciferous shells. The same thing with seashells. And these things grow in sort of a patterned they're, they're good examples of pattern development because when they grow, they form these little shapes and, uh, you know, banding patterns. And so that's, uh, like, that's been a major problem in the area of morphogenesis. So people have tried to understand that. And there have been different models, but uh, hopefully that all fits together as I go through this. Mm. So uh, one, one question this, that we're going to talk about first is, and this is a little bit far away from the seashells and, and uh, bridges, but how do connectomes connect during development? So one question, one way this sort of method can be uh, useful is to look at connectomes during development. So these are connectomes. I know we've been talking about like, you know, connectomes and vehicles, but these are real life connectomes. And mm -hmm. we have in this case, it's this is the human brain. Yeah. And uh, this is the human brain. It's featured in this paper here, uh, the decade of the connectome. And, uh, you know, this is where they've actually built a network model of the human brain. How are all these, like, nodes, they call them, which are different areas of the brain connected together? Uh, mm -hmm. in, in a similar way, the Drosophila visual system, uh, people have drawn out maps of that. So Drosophila is a fruit fly. And they have, of course, an eye. They also have like a brain, you know, like we do. And these are all the components of this visual system. So from the retina to parts of the brain to higher centers of processing. And they have these different parts that are related to functions, emotion behavior and color related behavior. And they have these numbers labeled or these labels of these nodes, and those are the areas of that are involved. And so they're all connected in some way. And so then the question is, is how do connectomes connect? Well, some things we know about them. Uh, cells are born and they find other neurons to connect to. And in development, we're talking about neurons that form sort of in maybe in a way that resembles the adult um, phenotype, but more often than not, the kind of associated neurons that differentiate. And so we want to know how they connect. Um, a lot of times they end up, you know, you get a neuron and they try to find other neurons to connect to. So space is an important part of this because they emerge in different parts of the embryo and they try to find neighbors or functional neighbors. And so, is this process random, or is it guided by some heuristic? Um, we also actually also expect that this connectivity will be sparse across the network, but dense locally. So, like cells that are near each other in space will connect, you know, uh, more commonly than cells that are farther apart. So, but we need a set of principles that governs information trans transmission. So, sort of the efficiency of wiring or ways that we can characterize that efficiency. And more often than not, that relies on graph theory and showing how these things are connected and showing like the path length and things like that. So um, one program you can use to evaluate this, and this actually is a way to simulate the traveling salesman problem or this, this seven bridges problem that I mentioned in the first slide, uh, is this Concord TSP solver. So it's a program that allows you to simulate networks with nodes with the little dots and then build a route between them. 
but the route building is handled through some algorithm. So it's either some sort of, uh, you know, random uh, uh, algorithm, or it's like a heuristic algorithm that does some has some rule to it. So we can do this in different ways. And uh, so the traveling salesman problem, or the Bridges of Koenigsberg problem, is related to this Eulerian graph problem which is where you tour the edges and try to find the shortest path or try to find paths through the network that, you know, visit, you know, visit every path at least once. And so this is an example of uh, how the TSP solver can be used to create art. So they've created a wave using this, and it's just like you put a bunch of nodes down and you can simulate different shapes and, you know, find ways to connect these nodes. So that's a very long way of showing some of the experiments. So in this case, you can imagine a circular nervous system with two concentric layers. And I show this in the left-hand side. This is 24 mm -hmm. nodes and no edges at all. Now, these, network, these neurons are going to connect to one another, so that each of these nodes are a neuron. And they mm -hmm. connect in a way that you can see here. Uh, this first <clears throat> example is uh, where I define the number of edges. Actually, in both cases, I define the number of edges. And I wanted to see, I had like sort of a sparse condition and a dense condition. And I wanted to see how they connect. And so uh, I used the random method for connecting. So in TSP solver, I select the random method. And then I ran the algorithm. And so in the first case, I made 65 edges. <clears throat> which is like what I considered sparsely connected with a distance of 1,959 units. The units aren't that important, but it's suffice it to say that we can calculate the distance between these nodes and kind of get a sense of how much wiring there is in the network to create all these edges. Mm -hmm. uh, the next example was a much denser version, which was 275 edges. Again, not like where every neuron is connected to every other neuron, but just mm -hmm. to see what the connectivity looks like. And here it's much denser, but much, much, a much, much longer path to visit all the net neurons in the network. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's something that, that's one experiment on uh, like a circular nervous system. This is actually a different example. This is something you might find in an organism, like, you know, something with a head and a tail bilateral nervous system and so I just kind of plotted these out uh, in a way that looks like it could be a head and a tail right mm -hmm. so you have 39 nodes in this nervous system again with no edges we wanted to find the nodes and then we did it this same thing uh, this time we're as testing different algorithms out so in this case we have 65 edges and a distance of 1959 units uh, but in this case, we just wanted to see, like, if you connect this network sparsely using a nearest neighbor heuristic. So in this case, it's that the uh, nodes maybe next door to the node is more likely to be connected than something all the way on the other side of the network, like the head connecting to the tail. And so using that rule, we ended up with these little modules of connectivity. And so, you know, it's it's somewhat connected locally, but it's it's disjoint globally. Yes. Yeah. And and then so we contrasted that with something that generated many more edges. This is a heuristic random algorithm that made a lot of connections between the head and the tail. So the point of these experiments was to show that, you know, maybe we can learn something about a how neurons connect. Is it random? Is there some sort of like algorithmic principle at work or what? And this ten maybe suggests that maybe there is an algorithmic principle. Um, and you know, we, we can we can do this these experiments in more detail to show, you know, maybe how we have modules form, or maybe how we get long distance connections to form and so forth. So I thought that was a nice set of experiments and again I don't really have any more insight into it other than it's a neat result. Um, so again, we have, now we, we're, we can go on to talk more specifically about Euler paths and maybe how if you had a colony of cells like this Volvox colony, 
So Volvox is again a marine microorganism that has, so it's sort of a single single cell organism, but it has like uh, the cells live in an association. So it's it's somewhere in between a single cell and a multicellular organism. And so what's interesting about this is it's sort of a transition between like single cell organisms and multicellular organisms. But we know multicellular organisms have like a, maybe like a, a circulatory system and other things that the cells share. In Volvox, they're freely associated. And so where the uh, Euler paths come in handy here is to maybe show how cells maybe connect to one another uh, in a colony like this through maybe the exchange of materials between one another. So the idea here is that maybe they only have a certain number of connections between one another. So they might be gap junctions or they might be some other type of thing that connects the cells. And so we can use again the Euler paths principle. So in this case we can see what happens when we have an Euler path in different shapes. So this octahedron is an Euler path that connects these nodes. The dodecahedron is an Euler path that connects these nodes. And the idea is that you only want to make one connection between cells, and you want to be able to do this only once across the system. And that defines like maybe a coherent system of cells. And so again, each of these, in this case, each of these uh, shapes would be a cell, and they're connected through this network of uh, arcs, which are then defined, the intersection of arcs would be defined by the nodes. So that's a whole different way of looking at it. Um, so I used, for this one, I used a program called Graph Online. And this is a, I stumbled upon this. Uh, they actually have a GitHub repository that allows you to work with the code. But this is their interface on, on the web. And uh, the reason I use this is because it has the nice set of algorithms for finding Euler pads. And so let me show you how this works um, in terms of the math. So I, you define a network, you define the nodes, and you put them down in the interface. And then you draw edges between the nodes. So in this case, we have five nodes. And I didn't, I really violated the rule where, you know, the nodes define, like, the intersection of edges. Because this, there's no intersection here. But this yeah. shape here forms a complete Euler path. So what it does is it, it evaluates this network by starting at one node and just trying to visit every node. So you can see you can draw a path from 4 to 1 to 0 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 0. And you've visited every edge once and only once. Now we can contrast that with this network, which actually conforms to that principle I mentioned earlier, where you have each node defining the intersection of two edges or more edges. And this this looks a lot more complicated. And the graph is not, this is not an Eulerian path. So this graph does not conform to an Eulerian path because you can't visit every edge, you know, only once and make a complete tour of the network. So that's the way, that's sort of the evaluation of this. So when you get a complete Euler path, you know, this shape would be a viable sort of module of cells. And in this case, this would not be a viable module. And what I was thinking was that, like, you can find these, like, complex shapes that are, like, that conform to the Eulerian path. And then when you start to violate it, you cleave off the cells that don't conform and form a new module. And so, you know, you start, let's see if I have this slide next. Okay, well, I'll get, I'll get to that later, but you basically have these cells that divide, and then when they no longer can conform to this Euler path principle, then they form a new module. And I'll show you what that looks like in a bit. But the other part of this is that once you have this network and it conforms to the Euler path, then you can scale or deform the image. So this network, if it conformed to an Euler path, you could take nodes and move them around the space, and it would mm. still conform to an Euler path. 
And you can do this in different ways, so rotation or scaling or perspective changes. And what you end up with is something that looks like this, which is a graph. So this is like a, this is the original graph for this. And all I did was take this, this conforms to an Euler path. And I took this middle node and I stretched it out in this direction. So like in development, you see this where there's stretching and, and translating the shape from different, you know, things and landmarks in the, in the uh, embryo. And so in this case, now we've got this stretched out uh, network, but it still conforms to the Euler path. And this is something called a conformal mapping uh, in, in terms of the math. So you just take this shape here and you stretch out the nodes so it stretches out the edges and you end up with these complex looking shapes, which are much, maybe much more uh, asymmetrical than the original. So this is the final part of this. Uh, this actually shows like taking those shapes and, you know, starting to look at like replication of cells and what that looks like. So in this case, I have a hexagonal motif, and I'm starting to like, uh, you know, let the cell. So this is the hexagon. The hexagon divides. That's one step. The hexagons divide again. That's two steps. So you go from one cell to two cell to four cells, and then to, um, in this case, it's five cells. So there is a just an asymmetrical division there, and they divide in you know certain directions. And this number here represents a uh, number of steps from Euler circuit completeness. So a zero means it makes a complete Euler circuit. Uh, in this, and so you just, in this case, for the hexagon, as you uh, multiply or as you divide the cells into to clones, you still get this complete Euler motif. Uh, but in this case here, where you have a rectangle that divides into different shapes, you see that you can violate the Euler path, complete Euler path. Uh, you go from one cell to two cells to three cells to four cells in this case. Uh, and then when you get to this stage, which is an asymmetric division, you can either go to the complete Euler motif of this phenotype, or you can go to the non-complete Euler motif of this phenotype. And so, you know, you could get there through, say, like mutation of the process of division. And then you would, there would be no modularity in this, so you would divide this up into two modules. And you can actually escape this lack of Euler completeness by, uh, you know, just dividing it up into two modules and adding on to the each module uh, in the same way, of, in the, using the same division rules. So, you know, this, this forms a, a lineage tree of sorts where you divide, you know, you look at how cells divide over time and you see what the state of the entire network is. Um, this is again using triangles. So this is a multi-cell lineage tree again where you start dividing or replicating the cell, making clones. And you can think of it as cell division or you can think of it as cloning. Uh, in this case, you have modularity by adding a hexagon into the middle and then adding that rule. Uh, you can also violate the uh, Euler completeness of this network and then get out of it in two ways, either by changing, you know, adding on a, a cell to the top of the network, or you can make a couple of rounds of uh, division and cloning and adding in shapes in different ways to get back to Euler completeness. So I think the Euler completeness is a good, like, heuristic for like figuring out maybe how cell division works in a multicellular organism, you know, in a very simple multicellular organism or something else. And, and that, I mean, those are just some, uh, just some thoughts that I had about like those sorts of problems. Now, this relates to something that is, and Jesse said, ah, so I know he's interested in this. Uh, it's very interesting work. This is something called On Growth and Form. And it's a book by someone called Darcy Thompson, who was a, uh, I think he worked in the 19th century, early 20th century. He was a, an embryologist. And he, what he observed in nature was that you have all these shapes of organisms that are 
sort of conform to mathematical laws. So this is a shell, seashell. And you can see in his book that he translated the seashell formation or the growth of a seashell into this curve. So he actually mm -hmm. looked at the mathematics of phenotypes. So he like took he took different species of fish, for example, and he put it on a grid. And so he said, okay, I'm going to take this one type of fish, I'm going to put it on a grid, and I'm going to put pins in the landmarks of the fish, like the, where the pectoral fins are, where the snout is, where the tail is. And then I'm going to take other fish and compare it to that grid. But I'm going to take that grid and I'm going to transform the grid based on those landmarks. So when you take different types of fish, you know, the distance between the pectoral fin and the snout are different. So you stretch the graph accordingly to conform to those shape differences. And so you can end up with these transformations of shape that are actually interest, very interesting how the, you know, coordinate system gets warped based on the yeah. changes in phenotype. And so uh, it, this book is huge, and it was written about 100 years ago. So they had an 100th anniversary conference, and here's the link to that, that uh, conference. And there's actually a lot of nice visualization at that site. I'm not going to go through it, but I think that sort of is the kind of the direction I'm going in with this work. And it's again, it's pretty early, so I mean, a lot of it maybe doesn't make too much sense, but something something I'm thinking about. Um, I just wanted to share it with you. Yeah, that's. I mean, obviously, I'm interested in that stuff for sure. Yeah. Um, did. There's a lot. I don't, I'm not familiar with graph theory that much, so it's something I should look into. Um, did uh, the person who wrote that book? Did he? Did he talk about? Um, like, I guess the top. I guess the keyword is conformal mapping. Yeah. Is that? Was he? Was that sort of essentially what he was basing a lot of it on? Or I don't know if that was like established as a thing at his time. Um, I'm, so, I mean, you know, he did all this without computers. Right. right. Was, yeah. <laughs> so, like, mathematics took a huge leap when computers, when we really got into computers. Like, I mean, like, not like Babbage's computer, but I mean, like, um, you know, like a supercomputer, like home computers, where you can actually, you know, once they invented calculators, we could make leaps in what we could calculate because we could do it, you know, digitally and we could do it in a, automated way. So there are a lot of problems that made advances after computers became common. Um, he didn't, I don't, I don't know the history of conformal mapping. It might have been a very niche area in mathematics before or at mm -hmm. Darcy Thompson's time. But I mean, as far as I know, I mean, people have explored some of this stuff, like in the artificial life literature, but not as much as they really probably should revisit it. <laughs> because he wrote this really thick book and it was just like yeah. putting down graphs like, you know, uh, you know, with string or with paper and pen and just kind of figuring this stuff out. But we can do we can do so much more with computers and I think with like uh like pathfinding algorithms and other mm -hmm. types of things like that, we could really kind of maybe make some advances in that. Mm -hmm. Did you send me that book before? Because I know I've come across that book in a different few ways, but I, I don't know if I came up with things that we talked about before directly in the lab or not. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, but okay. I, mean, I think there's probably something on Google Books. Oh, yeah. I think I have a copy of it. But I, yeah. I was just surprised, like, oh, it's one of those things that I've had discussions about. It's like, did I talk about it here with, with Bradley before? I don't remember. So I don't know if I was like, oh, no, I should remember something about that or not. But, yeah. Uh, no, it's good. Uh, I really like the presentation. Um, is it, will it be like available to look at later or? Oh, oh yeah, I can post it in the, in the Slack channel. So that would be good. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is just, yeah, if, if you're interested in something, we can talk about it more because I just kind of wanted to put some stuff together for this to see, you know, how it fits yes. together in my own mind too. Um, yeah. So we can talk about it. I'll give the slides out. Uh, Ankit, did you have any comments? Uh, actually, I, I like the idea. And we have, uh, I actually attended a course called Cognitive Information Processing at my university. And there, nice. there, they, say, yeah, there they say that 
we have a hebbian theory of uh, of learning and memory which says neurons that fire together wire together so basically we have already the connectomes are already there but the 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 networks which are firing simultaneously they make uh, they make stronger networks and thereafter uh, memory or learning is established so and uh, actually uh, i got to know about something called human connectome project which which is for map- mapping the human connectome so it looks something related to it although i was just fascinated i, I didn't know much about it yeah yeah would, oh you said the human connectome project is that like a larger is it like part of the human brain project kind of thing or yeah i think i actually read it on web it was something like the way we have uh, we have the human genome project uh, mm-hmm. accomplished so similarly we have a human connectome project which is a project which aims to map all the human uh, connectomes basically neural networks human okay networks. so maybe i don't know if it is a complete or it's still on yeah yeah um, yeah so mm-hmm. i mean yeah heavy in learning <clears throat> is of course a principle that you know we can use in in networks so you know you, the question is then <clears throat> there is a issue before you get to that though where neurons in development form <clears throat> and then they have to form connections so they have to actually find partners to form physical connections and so the you know the the idea is that you know you make connections the neurons make connections in development through some process and then after they're connected then those connections are reinforced with heavy in learning so it's actually much more subtle than like just you have connections or you don't it's actually like you form connections and then they have to be maintained and then if they're not maintained maybe they go away or you know maybe you form new connections you know based on some other you know maybe it's a heavy in principle maybe it's something else but yeah i mean i didn't put any heavy in learning in this model because you know it may make sense to do that too there might actually be a way to combine heavy in learning with like a you know some sort of uh network or graph theory principle so i mean you know there are yeah. ways there are options for that is that what z did with his stuff uh, yeah z actually created a model with heavy in learning in his vehicles hmm. so i'm not sure like uh what the I mean, you know, we'd have you'd have to talk about it a bit more how we implemented it. I think it's just like it's like a update rule. So like mm. it's like, you know, how we uh might think of selection or you know, something at different stages where you evaluate all your connections and you say which ones are associated with each other and we'll reinforce those. So it's very cy- cybernetics oriented. I think mm. it actually comes out of the same time period. because Donald Hepp yeah. was in the mid 20th century and and it actually is important in like the uh McCullough Pitts neuron which became like you know the, one of the precursors to our models of understanding both uh you know uh networks in the brain and neural networks so people or, you know if you look at early neural networks really early neural networks papers they talk about heavy in learning and hmm You said did you say Donald someone? Donald or? Hebb. That's the oh. neuroscientist. Yeah. Okay. And it mm-hmm. Hebb in is, is you know it's Hebb's method. Yeah. 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 So yes. um, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then of course reinforcement learning is related to that as well. Yeah, exactly. And actually, there are a lot of uh, different graph graph drawing algorithm. I actually worked on graph theory for some time. So there are many graph drawing algorithms which are which actually uh, like depending upon what type of uh, requirement we have, we have different types of graph drawing algorithms. So we can certainly uh, like look into that also. Uh, how how like when when we will really concerned about. we have certain set of points and how these things are connected there are multiple ways and if there's something organized so and that thing actually naturally happens in nature so that thing can explain certain things i suppose yeah mm-hmm. yeah right. okay well we want to talk about anything else uh, we're at the after i passed the top of the hour so 
Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, we can continue conversing on Slack if you have anything you thought of after we leave the meeting. And, uh, you know, if you need anything, let me know. Okay. Just, just send it this link. Okay. Link to the yeah, that would be good. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for coming this week. And thanks, Ankit, for your uh, presentation on your, your demo. And thank you, Jesse, for making comments and everything and we'll talk next week okay, okay. it was good yeah take, take care